Dagon is going down. How many of you guys know the story of Dagon, right? And he literally went down. But the Lord cannot be put into captivity, church. The Lord cannot be put into captivity. Okay, he's not going to be captured. He will not be held hostage, right? He will not be subject to man's ways. He simply cannot. God cannot be put into captivity. Say it with me. God cannot be put into captivity. He just simply will not be put into captivity no matter what. Amen? And so we walk with the Lord, right? We, he, he lives on the inside of us. And so if the spirit of God that lives on the inside of us, and I already said that the Lord cannot be put into captivity, then the reality is, and the truth of it is, is that neither can we. We can't actually be put into captivity unless we allow it. Of course, you can always allow it, but we, do, we wouldn't want to allow it, right? So there is so much power and strength on the inside of us that we get to learn our identity, our authority in Christ, and walk in, this, in, the, in the understanding that God in me, the hope of glory, I won't tolerate anything that comes from the enemy, right? So Dagon is going down. Psalm 145 and verse uh, 13 says, His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion endures Forever, it endures throughout all generations. This is the kingdom of whom we serve, the kingdom of God. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. This is Psalm 145, 13, if you're taking notes. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures. It endures throughout all generations. Amen. Hallelujah. Isaiah 45 and verse 4 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Hallelujah, there is no God besides me. I am the Lord. This is what he says. I am the Lord, there is no other. There is no God besides me. So no power can take you away from the Lord. You are believers in Christ. No power can take you away from the Lord. No, no power, no, no presence can stop the, the plan of God in your lives. Right, amen. Unless, of course, we let it. We're not going to let it. Amen. So that was Isaiah 45, for those that are taking notes, Isaiah 45 and verse 4. Okay, so Psalm 145, 13 and Isaiah 45, 4. We carry the presence of God. Oh, Lord, let us identify with that and let us recognize it more and more and more. Because we carry the presence of God. And so that means the power of God in, in us is enough to overthrow we, it's enough. The power of God in us is enough to overthrow any demonic agenda, the enemy prowling around against you, basically. The power of God in us, because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, right? So we actually have dominion. We have dominion. We have dominion power. We have power for miracles. We have authority in his name to walk uprightly and to see it and to say, oh, no. I'm walking in the kingdom dynamics. I'm walking, I'm, I'm walking connected with the Holy Spirit, and I won't allow any invading spirit. And we just called out so many of them. And look at the Lord's power. Look at how he healed already. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. So uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 5, we were reading and, and going through this story. And once Eli and his sons died in battle, the Philistines tried to capture the ark. As a matter of fact, they did capture the ark. But it came at a great cost to them. It came at a great cost. So 1 Samuel in chapter 5. And it says here in verse 2, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So Dagon is the name of their God. When the Philistines took the ark of God and they put it right into the house of the false god. The false, they, they put it right into the temple and in, in, in idol temple place of worship, right? Literally in the place where they would worship and bow down to the demonic statue. Because it is a demonic statue. It's a demon statue. They put the spirit of God, they put the ark of God right next to this ungodly demonic deity. Really? Are you ready for a showdown? Because this is not going to be okay. Dagon was their primary god. Okay, the head, the, the head and the body of a man, and then the lower torso of a fish. And so we have seen other demonic statues that are also similar, half man, half animal, right? So, but this is Dagon, and, and they, wor they worship this statue as the father of Baal. You know how wicked Baal was. So this statue, Dagon, was worshipped as the father of Baal. 
wicked. Say it, it's wicked. So now let's look. So think about it. They, 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 they steal, they capture the ark of God. They bring it into their idolatrous temple worship, and they put it right next to their pagan God, the presence of God. Let's look at verse 3. And when the people of Ashdod rose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth be before the ark of the Lord. So they got up. Something happened last night. Uh, I don't know what happened last night, but something happened last night, and that enemy is going down because God doesn't sleep. He does not slumber. You may be sleeping, but he's still working. So when they woke up, they see this demonic statue fallen right on its face. And they, and they were like, oh, my. They, it fell right on its face. That means it fell prostrate right before the Lord. It didn't just fall. It was like it could have it fell on its back. It could have fell on its side. But no, it fell prostrate right before the presence of the Lord. It fell prostrate because every demonic agenda is going to bow down to the name of Jesus. Yeah. While you sleep. While you sleep, God is still working. While you sleep. Because God never sleeps and he doesn't slumber. you got to have that kind of confidence knowing that, you know what, I've done my part. I've prayed. I've fasted. I'm staying in the word. I'm not allowing, you know, lies and thoughts that creep into my mind, my, my soul. you got to do your part. But as you do your part and you go to bed at night and you put your head on the pillow, you got to know that God is still working. And every giant in your life, he will slay. Yeah. That was just night one. But they didn't get the picture fully. So what did they do? They picked up their idol. They brushed it off. They, they, they decided to, let's reposition him. Let's try it again. Some people have to learn the hard way, guys. Some people just don't, you know, they don't get it, and they got to learn the hard way. Don't be one of them. So night two. Let's read night two here. So verse four. And when they arose again the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. But this time it wasn't just fallen on its face. This time the head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off. And yes, glory to God. And it was only the torso left. So it's fallen on its face again for the second time. But this time it was dismembered. This time the literally the parts of its body had to be cut off. We just dismember every demonic assignment coming against us in the name of Jesus. We don't allow the, the, the enemy to come against us. The almighty presence of God destroys, cuts off, and dismembers this rebellious false deity. What is he doing in your lives? What is he doing in your life? You have to see the presence of God. you got to say, yes, Lord, I recognize what you're doing. I'm not the same today as I was yesterday. Why? Because God is at work. God is at work. So two nights of the same, they finally realized, oh, dear Lord, this is not going to go well for us because the hand of the Lord is against us. We need to get rid of this. We need to get rid of this ark. We don't want it anymore. Well, you thought you were so great by taking it and bringing it into such a, a horrific, a demonic, just a diabolical place. You thought you were so great, but now you see otherwise. God's power will never, ever, ever be made a, a fool or a mockery. So look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, but the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod. You better believe it. And he, he ravaged them and he struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. So not just the people that were right there in, in, that, in that demonic temple, but even in the surrounding territories. The hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people, and God struck them with tumors. Oh, yes, he did. They realized quickly 
You can't have Dagon and God Almighty in the same room right next to each other thinking that they are of equal power. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you're in places, in environments where they're worshiping a false god and it may just be the god of themselves. It may be the god of humanity. It just may be some immoral god. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But you're right there and they're taunting you. You're carrying this presence of God, the ark of God, the presence of God, which is now on the inside of you, right? And you're being placed and positioned next to such ungodliness, next to such vile, just, just, just God's, I mean, just the enemy spewing out and you're there and you're going, God, this is not okay. God, something has to be done. Lord, what are you going to do? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. This is not just an Old Testament story that we read about and go, well, that was amazing. That was all in the Old Testament. But, you know, that's not what God's doing today. You better believe it. He doesn't change. But he needs his people to stand in faith and to stand with authority and say, oh, no, you don't get to have your way. When it comes to me anyway and that which belongs unto me, my family, my church, those people that God has entrusted in my life, you don't get to have your way. So we serve you notice, devil. You got to serve the devil notice. And you got to tell him no, no, and no again. You don't get to have your agenda. You don't get to have your plan. You don't get to have your wicked ways when it comes to do with me and my own. And that's you taking authority and recognizing, you know what? Oh, mm -mm -mm. It may be standing next to you. You may, have be, you, may be, you may be in the vicinity. You may have to be for a season right where the demonic assignment, all the junk, all the, all the worldliness, right there. And you have to be right there. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's your job. Right? And, and so you feel like, oh, man, I'm, and God hasn't released you. And maybe it's like what you do and it's here it is and every day and every day. Well, you are not left helpless. You are not left hopeless. You have authority. And this, is, this battle is won in prayer. You will pray. You will see the hand of God move because God is truly the same. But you got to see it and you got to open your mouth and say, oh, no, that day gone is going down. It's being dis dismembered. Use the word of God. It's being dismembered. It's going down. That Dagon spirit or whatever that is that's going on in your life, right? The hand of the Lord. It was against the whole city. And he struck them with tumors. Well, you know what that did? Everyone was basically, people started to hear. And they said, oh, my goodness, we can't have this. We don't want the ark of God. We do not want it. We do not want it. That was verse 6. Look at verse 7. And so when the, when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh towards us, and Dagon our God. So they recognized it. <laughs> you got some people that still, they won't see. They, some people, they can't even see what's happening, that, hey, there, this is, you're, you're being, there's a discipline happening because you're, you're, you're doing what you shouldn't be doing. And, and this is a judgment that comes from God. And you, you're too blind to even see it. No, they saw it. They saw it. And they said, the hand of God is harsh against us. So we, we can't have this. We don't want that ark. We don't want it anymore, right? Look at verse 7. And so let's jump down to uh, uh, 9. Right before verse 9, it says, so they carried the ark of, the, of God of Israel away. Yeah, they were smart. They realized, they realized, you know, what does a Christian have, have to have in common with Belial? What? Nothing. Right? So they realized, even though they were not on the side of the Lord, they, they still realized. So look at verse 9. So it was after they had carried it away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and and great, and tumors broke out on them. Wow. So basically, they continue to send this, this uh, ark of God's presence elsewhere. And wherever it was sent, tumors struck out. And people were getting diseased. And people were dying. Because God will not be mocked. 
and you will not be made a fool. Remember, God laughs at the enemy. He laughs at the enemy. And you may be standing and praying in faith, and maybe you, you're praying and praying, and it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it does. But maybe it didn't happen overnight for you. But you keep on keeping on, and you keep on strong in his word. And don't let up because God is faithful when he sees his people also faithful. And he's always faithful. But he will answer that heart's cry. And not only that, the devil loses its power because you won't relent. Because you recognize this is the, the battle that we are to partake in and not stop. And not stop. Because the enemy is crafty, but God is greater still. So let me, let me see here. Let, let's let's read, read verse 10. So uh, they sent the ark of God to, to Ekron. And so here it keeps going. It went to Gath. I don't think I read that, but it went to Gath. Then it went to Ekron. So the ark of God came to, to Ekron, and they cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and to our people. So they had already heard that every city that this ark went People were dying. Well, tumors were breaking out, and people were getting sick. And so now it's in Ekron. They're like, we don't want it. We do not want it. Take it back. We do not want it. They actually said, send it away. Send away the ark of God of Israel and let it not go back. It says, and let it go back to its own place. We don't want it here. Why are you bringing it here? Right? He says, we don't want it. It says, we don't want it because it will kill us and our people. Are you reading the same Bible I'm reading? I'm in uh, the middle of verse 11. It's going to kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city, and the hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die, so many died. But the men who didn't die were also stricken with tumors. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. Wow. So they were, so this ark, this ark of God's presence is stolen, right? It's captured. It's captured in, in the battle, in the battle that they weren't even supposed to be in. They didn't ask Samuel. They, they just went and Eli was alive at the time. And so they, they steal, they, they brought the ark of God into the battle, of which they should not have done. God didn't tell them to do that. Did God ask you to do that? Always ask that question. Did God ask you to do this? Lord, do you want me to do this? Don't just do your great idea, because sometimes those great ideas don't come from God, and they create further captivity. And so the ark was in a place where it shouldn't have been in the first place. Of course it got captured. But then when it got captured, and it's going from one city to the next city to the next city, God's not going to be mocked. He will never lose. It's people that lose, but God will never, he's never going to lose. And so he says, you know what, he's all, the, the tumors are breaking out on all these people because that's not where the presence of God belongs. It belongs with God's people. God's presence is holy. God's presence is pure. And we have to honor the presence of God on the inside of us. So that and now we don't have the ark that travels around, right? We have the presence of God that literally moves in us. And every time I go someplace, you go someplace, you're carrying the presence of God. And so we must make sure that we are holy vessels and that we go to that which is holy. And we draw that bloodline when we recognize that is not of God and I will not partner myself with something that is not godly. Right? Let's just say again, same scenario. Maybe it's your job or someplace that you have to go to. And you might say, well, but I have to go there for the season, for the time being. But you don't have to go there in your thinking. You don't have to go there in your emotions. You don't have to bow down. You don't have to compromise. You don't have to say it's okay. You don't have to keep your mouth shut. You can speak when God tells you to speak. And we'll be silent when he tells us to be silent. But we will be people of prayer. And we also know that we know that we know that God will take care of all of this. Even while we sleep, if so be it. And if that's what's needed, even while we sleep. You know, all of this, and, and Samuel, they didn't even ask Samuel to come into this battle. They didn't, they didn't ask him. He was already proven that he was a prophet of God. He already had proven that he hears from God. But we're going to see in the next few chapters just how the man that God approved and had his hand on starts to rise up in the scene and literally take over and do what is needed to be done so that people don't fall prey to demonic captivity. 
We are the people of God that he is saying, I want you to rise up. You may see the wickedness all around you, but be ready. Samuel was ready. And in, in, the, in the next chapters, we're going to see how he is now called back onto the scene. Just because you see it happening all around you and you see that it's wrong doesn't mean that God is not going to use you in that next page, that page turns, as that day dawns. It doesn't mean that he's, he is going to use you, but you got to be ready. you got to see it and you got to prepare your heart. Let this heart, let this vessel be a prepared vessel, ready to do the will of God. And don't be afraid of the backlash. Sometimes people get so afraid of standing for truth and standing against the face of evil because they're afraid of the backlash. If you're afraid of backlash, you need to get prayer because that right there is already a sign that there's too much, there's fear in you. And you can't walk in faith and walk in fear at the same time. One has to give way to the other. And we're only called by God to walk by faith. And that's the only way that we please God is when we walk in faith. Right? So even a little bit of fear can drive out faith. And it can take over if we let it have its residence. We can't. We've got to identify and go, oh, no. Uh-uh. Because I am called by God. Say it over yourself. I'm called by God. I am his ambassador. And I'm going to do the will of God. And so I'm going to live ready. I'm armed and ready for the battle. And I will not shrink back. So, Lord, make me ready in any area that I'm unaware of. Go deeper, heal my heart, heal my mind and my soul, but I'm ready for you. I commit myself to your hands in the name of Jesus.